Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. Um, so I want to, I want to share about a, a message called um, a transformed heart, a transformed heart. So I don't want to focus so much on demons. I know you'll love your demons, but uh, let, <laughs> let me tell you this, that whatever I teach on it to make any difference, it always ends, it always ends up with demons coming. <laughs> they just get in my way. I don't have to focus on them. They just, they just, if you advance the kingdom, they're in front of you, hindering you. So you've got to get some fight in you. Okay, so, so a free heart will produce good fruit. A free heart will produce good fruit. And uh, often you don't hear much teaching on the heart. And uh, the Bible can be a little confusing in its language. It talks about the spirit of a man, talks about the soul, and uh, it talks about the heart. And sometimes it mixes up how it refers to them, so it makes it a little unclear. But they, they actually they are quite distinctive. The spirit man or spirit part of you is the part which enables you to enter and live in and express life in the spirit realm. It's the part God joins to you when you receive Christ. The spirit of God enters your spirit, becomes one with your spirit. You are now anchored as a person able to live in the physical world and interact with the physical world and interact with the spirit world. But there, there is a part of you, like if we say the heart of a problem, we're talking about the core of a problem. Heart of a tree, the core of a tree. So I want to just talk a little bit about a heart. Let's have a look in um, 1 Samuel 16, 7. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Because you need to understand that the heart, your heart is the center of God's attention. Your heart. We get Religion will get you wound up with all the behaviors and, and your lacks and shortcomings, but God is looking at your heart. And so here's a great scripture here, and the background is that uh, Samuel the prophet has been commanded to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the king of Israel. And so he goes there, and David, the youngest, is out in the field, and David is not even considered valuable enough to be in the meeting with the prophet. He's excluded. And so the first son that comes out really tall, he's good looking, he's handsome, he's a great guy. And Samuel looks and says, whoa, that's a king. And, uh, God, and, and here's what God says to him. He said, uh, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. And the word means to utterly reject him as being unsuitable for the task and assignment I have. How about that? And he said, for man looks on the outside and, but, uh, but the Lord looks on the heart. So the heart is the attention or the focus of God's attention. People look at externals. So if you want to present yourself to people, present yourself well because they look on that. That's the, the externals. But um, people focus. The focus of people is on how you appear. It's on your wealth, your position, your power, the car you drive, what you own, all that kind of stuff. And that impresses them. But that doesn't reveal the heart. Uh, you see, religion will also focus on externals. So anything that's based in religion will focus on external conformity, trying to change you so you look the same as everyone else, you behave the same, you speak the same, you're conformed externally, but inside the, the hypocrisy is evident because there's all kinds of things operating in the heart. And so uh, religion will move people to feel they're never good enough and strive always to try and conform so they get approved of. It's a, it's a bondage. In, uh, in we, we deal with the Pacifica community locally, and uh, in, in their church, for example, they will tell publicly read out what everyone gave to shame people into conformity. It's like... It's just part of the culture to shame them, to religious culture. So the focus of uh, God's, God's focus is always on your heart, the what is in your heart and why are you doing what you're doing. And uh, we've got to actually make that. If that's God's attention and his focus on that, then it's got to be ours as well. How about that? So now think about Jesus' ministry. His first major sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, was about the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. So all of that focus of the Sermon on the Mount is about the culture of the kingdom of heaven. 
His message was the kingdom of heaven. He said, if you want to live in a kingdom, you've got to understand the rule of the king and the culture and ways of the kingdom. So he tells you the ways of the kingdom. Now, this is not about performing. This is about your heart. So he teaches like, he said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. That's a behavior. But he said, if you lust after a woman, you have conceived adultery in your heart. So he said, God wants a higher standard than just not committing adultery. He wants a pure heart that's free of lust. And he said, you know, you heard it said, you shall not murder. Because I'm telling you, if you hate a brother in your heart, you've committed murder because the seed of the murder is in your heart. All it takes is a provocation and murder comes out. That's why you'll sometimes read uh, of someone being arrested for killing someone. And when you, when you hear the story, they say, I don't know what came over me. Well, what came over them was very simply demonic. And, what, and the reason it came over them is because they've harbored hatred in the heart. The seed then manifested its fruit. And so all, all things work from what's in our heart. So if you think about Jesus' teaching on the parables, he said this one parable is more important than all other parables. If you don't get it, you won't get the kingdom. You won't understand it. And that's the parable of the sower and the seed. Mark 4.24, he said... Let everyone have ears to hear. And then he says, he talks then about the heart. And he talks about the necessity of hearing with your heart and responding from your heart. So you read the parable. It's the parable about the sower sowing the seed. The seed has got good, good it's got life in it. The issue is the condition of the heart. And so we can preach a message. And it doesn't matter really what the message was. It'll find root and produce fruit in a good heart. And it's our responsibility to be a steward of our heart because there's so many things come from our heart. So you think about um, a relationship with God or any kind of relationship. God wants you to love him with all your heart. So in other words, you can't love him just by doing stuff. He wants your heart. See, and, and uh, in Proverbs, it tells you, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Heart. I mean, you find the scriptures there every once you start to look, you see the scriptures on the heart are everywhere. Yeah. And uh, your heart can be directed or trained towards God or towards other things. So your heart is very, very important. And, uh, and, and it's the center of our life. Trust in the Lord with all our heart. So in Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Proverbs 4, 23, it tells us of the importance of the heart. The heart is the center of your life. And so it tells us in Proverbs 4.23, guard or protect your heart with all diligence. It doesn't say just think about it from time to time. It says you must guard your heart. You must be a watchman for your heart. And the reason is because out of your heart flow the issues. That's the boundaries and the expressions of your life. So your life really is just the expression of the things you have cultivated in your heart. If bitterness is growing in your heart, bitterness will flow out in your relationships. You can't stop it yeah. because you're designed that whatever's in your heart will come out. Yeah. The Bible says initially it will come out through your mouth. So out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you listen to people, it doesn't matter how smart and clever they are, they, can, they will give it away if you're a listener. You will literally hear what's in their heart. I remember going to a very famous uh, minister and everyone was raving about him and the influence he's having, all that thing. And I went and I sat through, I was reluctantly sat through one session and about in the middle of it, uh, as he was sharing and expressing, I heard him and I heard him and I saw him manifest. Just like that. I, I know what's in your heart. So all this other stuff doesn't impress me because I know there's anger and control in your heart. And so whatever you're saying ultimately will fall apart because of what you've got grown in your heart. And in due course, it all became public and the whole scandal around it. And, and then people were affected. But everyone had taken on his thinking, not realizing or discerning. Actually, there was brokenness in the heart. There were issues in the heart unresolved. And that determined how he, the philosophy and the way of doing ministry. And so for those who followed it, that's a real problem. In Proverbs 4.23, if we look at them, the Passion Translation, it's really good. So above all, above all, guard the affections of your heart. So that tells us you have affections in your heart, things you are attracted to and like and, and draw to. Guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. 
So your identity is established in your heart. Who you are, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So your identity is established in your heart. It's the center and core of who you are. He says, pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flows the wellsprings of life. So that raises the question, if God's focus is on our heart, Jesus' teaching was on our heart, his parables were on the heart, he prioritized the heart, why do we not understand and can't even define what the heart is? Why is it we, we're not giving attention to that? When the Bible says to guard your heart. Now the word guard there is the word meaning be a watchman over your heart. A watchman. And that's the same command that was given to Adam when Adam was given a piece of land that we call the Garden of Eden, and God gave him two commands for that piece of garden. He said, guard it or be the watchman over it and cultivate it so it produces fruit for the Lord. So his assignment was to take the the piece of land, protect it. That meant he had to be a watchman and watch what could come to steal this precious thing God had entrusted him to give him room to develop a faithful life so he could promote him so he said be a watchman over what God has given you and then create the environment or cultivate so it produces good fruit now you and I what God the garden God has given you is primarily your heart and you are to guard your heart or protect it from an enemy which seeks to get your heart's affection and attention Think of Solomon, who had two face-to-face encounters with God, and yet later on, his heart turned from God. And the consequence was generational loss. So where your heart is directed will determine the course of your life. God wants your heart and your affections. That raises the question, what is the heart? We talk about the heart. The heart is the core of who you are. It's a part of your makeup, a part of God's design for you, the hidden man of the heart, the Bible calls it, the hidden man. So there's a, your identity is found in your heart, the core part of who you are. Your heart interacts with your spirit and your soul and body, and it's from your heart your life flows, not your head. It's not your head. So it's the center of our identity. What you believe about yourself in your heart will determine how you will live your identity out. And it'll affect all your behavior. It's the center of your affections. It's the seat of your affections. So the heart is that part in the core of you where your affections, your identity, where your passions, where, where th- this is where they lie. If you, For example, God has brought every person into the world for an assignment. But how can you find your assignment? Well, it's simple. He wrote it in your heart. So if you won't connect with your heart, how will you find your assignment? How will you find what God has designed you for? If you've spent all your life trying to block your heart and cut off the feelings of your heart because your heart has become wounded. So the heart is where we experience intimacy in relationship. You know, we hear that, you hear that expression, well, he did the job, but his heart wasn't in it. Yeah. Does that make sense? No one likes a job where their heart wasn't in it. The Bible says, don't be half-hearted. Don't, don't do things out of half-hearted. Do everything diligently from the heart to the Lord. So, so if, you, if you love someone but never give them your heart, they don't feel you are intimate with them at all because you've hidden your heart. So your heart is the seat of your ability to build an intimate relationship. You feel love in your heart. And you also feel it if it's not there either. You can feel it. Your heart is a part of the spirit inner man. See? So not only that, your heart is the, the place, it's like a garden where you can, faith is developed. See, if a man believes in his and confesses with his, then the power of God is activated for salvation. So you see the importance of your heart. Whatever's got your heart has got you. See, and so sin begins in the heart. So Jesus talked about if you look after, to a woman and lust after her, you conceive adultery in your heart. In other words, your imagination, when you couple it with, when you make evil pictures in your imagination and couple it with a longing for it, the desire for what you see will actually conceive sin in your heart. 
uh, Peter said to Ananias, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? So sin begins in your heart. So trying to change your behavior and not dealing with the heart will never change your life. Religion tries to shape you to be conformed. God says, give me your heart. Give me your heart and I will transform your life. I'll put my spirit in you so you have the power to change. And I will also give you a new desire, a desire for me. That doesn't mean everything is changed and everything is right. You still have to cultivate and develop your heart. You get the idea? Okay. So we're commanded to guard our heart. Guard our heart. So in, in Proverbs 21, 2, it says, every way, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. So the culture we're in, of course, well, I do what, I've got my truth, I do what I think. But it says the Lord weighs the heart, weighs what your motivation is. So your motives are in your heart. The why you do what you do, is it because you overflow with love and want to give, or is it you're doing a trade? Now, trading means I give you this and you give me that. But what if I give you this, but I never tell you what I want, then I get offended because I didn't get it. That's just so dumb. And, and, and Christians do it all the time. Yeah, and so frequently I tell them I, they, they become offended over church, over leadership, and all that kind of thing. And I've done this, and I've served. I don't know. They tell me all the things they've done. I'll say, I listen to the story. Okay. And then I say, well, here we are. Just got one question to ask you. Was your service a gift or a trade? And they get shocked. Because if it was a trade, you were definitely ripped off. <laughs> if it was a gift, then you're like your father who just gives without worrying about people returning. Oh, oh, somebody stopped me on that one. You know, <laughs> and, and that's where people get upset. They kind of, kind of expect they'll be honored or they kind of expect that somehow people will thank them or notice them, something. And that's not, I mean, it's not unreasonable, but if that's what motivates you, you're in trouble. When they turn the other way and miss it all together and give someone else the credit, you get upset. Anyway, okay. So, so your heart is a very important, your heart is the most important piece of real estate you got because it'll determine where your life goes. So you've got to guard your heart, guard your affection. You guard it in your marriage. You think about what, why marriages fade away. Why is it they start off and they're at the altar and, oh, I love you. They're like Ben and Shelly. Oh, <laughs> You know, <laughs> there it is. The love is on. The heart is on fire with love. So, with many couples, I'm not saying them because they're on their honeymoon. They're telling me they're having a great time. Oh, great time! But I've been around a long time. I've seen couples, and then later on, everything's gone. There's no conversations, no fun. There's no joy. There's no laughter. Something has gone. The heart has gone from the marriage because it was neglected and other things came in. So you understand, you got, so one of the primary responsibilities we have is to guard and cultivate our heart so we remain passionately in love with Jesus until he comes. And not let what happens in church or in society or whatever cause your heart to become offended and shut down. All righty then. So we're getting the idea, your heart. How many got the idea? It's really important. My heart is really important. I get what it is. I can't see it, but I know it's boom bitty boom bitty boom right now. And uh, there's something going on in there. And so, you know, you, you can direct your heart and develop your affection for God, or your heart can be called off and you lose your affection. So in Revelation, book of Revelation, chapter 3, Church of Laodicea, God's uh, uh, Jesus rebuked from them. They did many great things, but he said the one thing is a problem is lukewarmness. You've lost your passion, your heart for me. So yeah, you're doing stuff, but I want your heart. I want you to love me. I want you to never lose your first love. He spoke to the church and he talked about, I've got this one thing against you. You left your passion, your first love. Where you just love him and enjoy him and want to be with him and want to hear from him. and all That gets lost on the way because things get into our heart. Okay, what kind of things then? So the Bible says your heart can be broken and damaged. Your heart can be broken. I, I know what a broken heart is like. I ended our marriage with a broken heart. And it was only years later that the Lord showed me that I needed to repent and deal with the brokenness in my heart. Now, it wasn't I didn't want to deal with it. I just didn't know how. And we would have ministers come, and you and I would talk and say, we, we need prayer, we need help with this. 
And it was like, we, it was like, we went, like they went, la, 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 la. I don't, I don't want to hear about that. And, I re, we, re, and, and we would talk after and we'd say, I think we asked them if they would pray for us and help us with this. And there's been no response. It's, a, it's weird. And then I come to realize, actually, they know a lot of Bible, but they don't know the heart. They just couldn't give any help. And so we went for quite some years in our marriage with a broken heart. Deeply broken heart serving God. And it wasn't until we pioneered our church in Hastings, where we are now, that actually I saw someone come into town who talked about the heart. I said, I want to go there. I, I want to get something fixed up in my heart. I don't know what to do and how to do it. And we went and God began to speak to us. And I remember going back to uh, after, after the meeting that day and going back. And as I knelt down to pray just before we went to bed, um, the Lord spoke to me and said, there's bitterness in your heart. And he showed me exactly the point it was conceived. And I wept and wept and repented and said, honey, would you forgive me? There's been a bitterness in my heart. And it started way back there. And she began to weep and she said, there's bitterness in my heart because of what happened back there too. And so we both knelt down and prayed and forgave. And God shifted the connection, the relationship, the intimacy. The, see, these things, you can't, you can't cover them, hide them, pretend they're not there. They produce a fruit. You have to face them. You have to resolve them. Get the idea? So Psalm 147, 3, it says, God heals the brokenhearted. That means because he's a healer. Now think about this. When, when Israel got redeemed and they came out of, out of Egypt and, and they're all, yay, 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 praise the Lord. You know, and they got their singing and their dancing. The Lord has done great things and all that kind of thing. Next day, three days later, they're complaining. Yeah. And, what, and what God had done was he had plenty of provision for them up here. He just took them through a bit of hardship to surface their bitterness. He wanted to heal the bitterness they carried from 400 years of slavery. And they were a generation who had their sons under two years old murdered. Child slaughter on a massive scale. There was a whole nation of people grieving. The, probably the woman had been assaulted. They were slaves in a foreign culture. And God said, I want to deal with your heart and your bitterness. And they all complain because of the bitter waters. But God showed them a tree, the cross, that when you put the cross into the bitterness and the bitter experience, there was healing. You understand? So we're going to get to that. The only way to get healed, really, so you can cast out the demons, but the demons will come back if you don't deal with the roots. You'll deal with the roots. So I love to cast out demons, but I've learned, man, they keep coming back to some people. <laughs> We're not dealing with the... Pro and then I read, Jesus said, they come back. In Matthew 12, he said in verse 43, through to 45, he said, they come back. Oh. And he said, then they find them. So you can't go to another campus and hide and think I can hide out over there. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You think, I'll go to another church, I'll hide out there. No, that won't work either. They find you. They've got an internet. They just locate you. I mean, I was in, I was in a place, we were, I was in a, having a move of God and we were having those meetings and demons are manifesting. And, and then I had a problem in the hotel, which is next to the church. People come into the hotel and start yelling my name and screaming, going crazy in the foyer. And the, the, they were told, the, the ch church pastor was told, you can't have this guy here. He's causing chaos in this place. Get rid of him. So they rang me up and they, they rang me up and they said, oh, pastor, we've got, we're putting you in a secret hotel. I thought, a secret hotel, awesome. This is exciting, a secret hotel. I'm going to a secret hotel. So only three people know. And I'm thinking, awesome, secret hotel, no one knows. Well, well I wasn't thinking clearly at all. Because I went to the secret hotel. This is great, I'm in a secret Only three people know where I am. That night at 1.30, there's a guy outside my door yelling and shouting and, and going through all this kind of noise. He woke me up and I thought, I thought, someone's having a row. I wonder what's going on. Then there's, no, there's one voice. Oh, no, it's about me. <laughs> there's a demonized guy. He just manifested outside the room. So, so the, the demonic realm can see you where you are. You can't run away. You, you're absolutely vulnerable there. You can hide and dress up nicely here, but nah, you're, you're just clearly visible up there. They, they see you straight away. They, they just see who you are. I remember going to one of my early deliverances, and there's a big tough guy, and I took someone with me because I was a little bit, I was learning. 
We'll put it, don't, don't learning, you know. And so when you're learning and there's a big strong guy and you're still learning, then I took someone with me. I thought, that's a good man. Here you go, him. Anyway, we took him out. We knocked on the door, saw the guy, and he was manif- in manifestation mode. And he looked at the guy and he just, oh, I laughed, and then went down the line and what was going wrong in his life. In other words, he's totally visible to the spirit realm. And the guy went red in the face, an elder in the church, and said, well, you're not much good in a battle, are you? You're too compromised. You're visible. And, and what they see is your brokenness. And you, you, you're not able to stand up in the fight because you haven't actually put your heart right with God. And, and so I prayed, and the guy just whoosh, fell on the ground like that, over. And uh, it was dramatic. It was really dramatic. You would have loved it. He would, some of you Marines would have loved it. He, got a, he, he, t- he picked up an apple and he held it into my face and he crushed it with his left hand. I tried it. It's very hard to do it. I need a softer apple, an older apple. He just went. It was crunched like that. He said, I'm going to crush you like that. And I'm like, Ooh. Then he picked up a chair and he said, I'm going to pull you apart like this. And uh, I thought, hmm. And then you know whether you know the Bible verse which says, you know, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and tread them underfoot. Nothing shall harm you. Nothing shall harm you. So I stood up boldly. It's not about feeling bold. It's standing up bold. In Jesus' name. And duke over he went like that. Demons came out. I thought, wow, how about that? Turns out I don't need to crush apples. I got someone who's strong who can help us. Okay. So he heals the brokenhearted and binds up all their wounds. So the word broken means to shatter, to be shattered. To be shattered means you're fragmented. What it, so it's, it's trying to look at like you had a, had a bottle and you dropped it. Uh-oh. All the pieces. What are we going to do with all these pieces? In fact, actually, your heart doesn't break like that. But you have chambers where, in the spirit where things are stored and painful experiences, and they leak out and overflow into your life. So the heart can be broken. Brokenhearted it means shattered or wounded. Uh, it, it means to bring to birth something that you don't really want to bring to birth. It's because you've gone through an experience that really hurt you. And it says he, he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds. And uh, the thing is there, that word wound means a pain and injury it all, and a sorrow, but it also means an idol. So the word for a wound, when you get wounded inside, also is used to apply to the word an idol. So what's an idol? It's a substitute or replacement for God, which you serve. So when you're wounded, the wounds will direct your life. Even though you want to serve God, they will have a power and an influence on you because of fear of being hurt again. They will cause you to try to control life and relationships instead of bringing it to the Lord for healing. That's why we need to deal with those things. Any idea? So our hearts can be broken or damaged because of things we experience on the journey. We didn't necessarily do anything wrong, but we were wounded by the behaviors of others. And those wounds are visible. And wounds, if you're well aware naturally, if you don't actually bind them up, become infected. And the infected wound is really serious and life-threatening. So we can be wounded. We can be wounded by rejection. I found many girls, and we've prayed for, their father wanted a boy and rejected them completely. And they've struggled all their life with the belief, no matter what I do, I will never be good enough. And that then becomes a driver through life. Uh, abandonment, when people are abandoned, abandoned by father, abandoned by mother. Abandonment, <clears throat> where we, we should be gathered up and, and nurtured. Abandonment deeply wounds people. A father leaving the family, a mother leaving the family. And it can't just be the death. There was nothing someone did wrong. They just died. There was an accident. But the abandonment feeling is very powerful. And, uh, you know, David said, when my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will gather me up. Because this is a deeply wounded experience. Betrayal is another one. Betrayal in relationships. When you enter a relationship, you gradually begin to trust someone. And if they betray the trust, it actually damages you at an incredibly deep level. And if you don't resolve it, then it determines the course of your life relationships. So many people enter marriage and actually they've already been betrayed 
by a man, by a woman, maybe a father, maybe a mother, maybe someone who abused them or whatever, and now they're entering in with distrust, a stronghold of distrust. You can't build any relationship when there's a stronghold of distrust because your basic concern is to protect your heart from being wounded again. That will drive everything, and everything will be filtered. You will see through the stronghold of distrust. Betrayal happens in church relationships sometimes, and it's, it's, uh, it's the most heartbreaking. It's one of the things that crushes leaders. Sexual relationships is often a cause when we violate God's order for a covenantal marriage and we enter into sexual relationships. Inevitably, there's wounding as well as defilement because you gave your heart to someone. And for women, <clears throat> they're expecting to be loved. The guy uses them, and they feel used and hurt. It works both ways. And uh, so it, deeply wounding. So these disappointments where we had expectations, now, they can be expectations in life of all kinds of things. We have expectations about leaders, expectations about pastors. You have expectations, hopes, dreams, whatever. And when they fail, disappointment can come in, and then it affects deeply your capacity to do life. Because now you won't trust, you won't take risks, you won't step out, you draw back. Your primary goal is to stay safe, not to engage. How can you have intimate relationship if you, your primary goal is to protect yourself from being hurt again? You can't do it. Uh, Performance-based acceptance, if you grow up in a family where the only way anyone says anything nice is if you do exactly what you're supposed to do, and, uh, and, or if you raise, say, in a family where you know, you've worked as hard as you can and you did the best you could at school, and then all you got was criticism. You may have got, I pray, we prayed for someone recently, they got second in class all the time, but nevertheless, oh, you should have got better. We prayed for one girl, and she'd got, I think, 95 to 98% in her mark. Well, why didn't you get 100%? Can you understand that critical performance-based approach was crushing when the person had done the best they could? Okay. And uh, so these are the sorts of things. Failure can cause deep wounding. Financial failure, marriage failure, failure in life in any area. Uh, ridicule in school can be a deeply wounding experience that you never get over. And I, I faced that myself in a stage where... I was uh, very young, I was about five, six, I think I was. So just starting school, just starting to get into that area. And uh, I got a, a thing called ringworm in your hair, which is sort of used to get it from animals. And uh, in those days, they didn't have any remedy for it. So they actually had to shave off and then pull out all your hair because that's where it grew. And so that was a humiliating experience, not just that that happened, but the ridicule of, ch of others in school, the peers. See, so you'll have your own experience of ridicule. Sometimes it's from a teacher. And, but those experiences wound the heart, and if you don't resolve it, they affect your ability to engage in other relationships. Controlling relationships or culture. Control is where someone... Uh, is, is self-centered and they just want compliance with everything and what it communicates is rejection. What I feel doesn't count, what I think doesn't count, what I want doesn't count, all it counts is I comply with what you want. You understand control brings rejection and destruction to people's hearts. Because they can't, they're not, the heart isn't free, it now has to be contained and hidden. And then they, you, once you start that way, then you go that way through your life. The same with religious legalism. Religious legalism conforms people. It doesn't engage the heart. And so people are, are cut down for their bad behavior or, or a non-compliant behavior and ridiculed and shamed, which is going on in the culture right now. Same thing. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. Uh, abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, all of those things bring deep wounding of the heart and defiling of people. Trauma experiences, all of these things can have an impact. So how would you know if you're wounded? How would you know that something needs healing and then what would you do to be healed? Okay, I better, better finish this pretty quick now. But I can tell you're attentive. I can tell. So I, I just, the, I felt the Lord say, just change what you're doing because people need to recognize. So let me, let me give you an example. It's if I give you a personal example, then I'll give you a list of a few things. I remember, how many know Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? Okay, the guys know him, all right, the woman thing, you know. 
we love Terminator movies, all this kind of stuff. So I love all the action movies. So I remember watching an action movie a while ago, and uh, True Lies. It was quite a long one, some years ago. Anyway, and, uh, and anyway, get to the end of it, and that's an action movie. It's an action movie. I watch an action movie. We get to the end of it, and then there's, he has a dance with his wife, and there was this music played. And when the music played, I felt tears come. I thought, oh, my Lord, what is this? This is an other movie, and I'm crying. How can I be crying? This is weird. And, and, and anyway, I, I left and I thought about it, and I watched it again about a year or two later, and the same thing happened. I thought, this is weird. There's something in me. Why would I be weeping or crying at an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie? You know? And I realized it wasn't him. It wasn't anything to do with the movie. It was the music. It was, and I thought, well, what I'll do is I will play the music. I'll find that music. I looked up and found out what it was, found out who played it, and I then began to play it. And I played it over, and sure enough, I began to weep. And I realized that sound is triggering an experience I have never resolved. And all that's happening is my heart is hearing the sound differently to my ears. My heart is reminded that there's sadness around it. And so I began to just sit down with the Lord and journal to find, and the Lord suddenly brought it to me. And uh, when we were going out together, I was from a Catholic background. Joy was from a Brethren background, or like Southern Baptist. And there was tremendous antagonism in those days to that kind of relationship. And so we, we were, I was constantly in this thing where the relationship was breaking up, but we were in the same classes. So this is a very hard season. But during that season, when we were very close and I was in love with her, um, I'd take her out to a restaurant. And in this restaurant, it was a very special one. Yeah, you had to knock on the door to even get in and silver. It was just beyond a student's kind of wage. We could barely, I could just pay for the main course. That was the, and the wine, that was it. And, and, but they had this group played. And there was an accordion and a bass and a violin that would come around the tables and play. And he played that song. And I'd forgotten that my heart had been so wounded because of the loss of passion that had taken place. It just reminded me of what I had and what I'd lost. And, and the Lord was able to bring a deep healing because of that. So how do you know? A tree's known by the fruit. So you just got to be looking for fruit. And if there's fruit, there's a root. You can't see the root, but the fruit is unmistakable. And so what would you look for? Well, one of them is unexpected emotions that suddenly come and you don't know why they came. They were triggered by something. And you feel the emotion. Most people try to hide it. But if you actually ask the question, what am I feeling right now? Where did that come from? What has triggered it? Uh, reactions to people and circumstances that are well out of proportion to what they did. It tells you you get really angry or really anxious or really irritated or you just lose it. And you think, well, that's out of proportion to what has been said or done. It is triggering something I'm carrying that I have never resolved. Um, walls, barriers in your heart in, to people where actually you won't connect, you draw back. There's, some, there's a wall, but you haven't... Your head doesn't understand why there's a wall. Your heart is just, uh-oh, backing out of there. And um, barriers in our heart to people or situations, uh, avoidance, so we don't go there. Some families have got whole patterns of avoidance. They won't talk about emotions and heart at all. And so you learn that we don't go there. We don't talk about that. Well, how are you going to build an intimate relationship? You won't go there, you know. I, I love this. <laughs> I love the. There's a comedy clip there on, on YouTube, um, Bob Newhart. It's just called Stop It. And he's a counselor and he won't go there. Every time she raises, and says, oh, we don't go there. Well, my, my mother, no, we don't go there. Yeah, well, my horoscope, no, we don't go there either. It didn't matter where it was, he never went there. He just said, stop it. That, that's called behavior modification. It doesn't deal with the heart. There's no way you're dealing with the heart that way. And, uh, or busyness. Some people just get, they fill their life with busyness, so busy. And everyone thinks, man, they're so amazing and awesome what they're doing. You don't know they're on the run because if they stop, they will feel the pain and don't know what to do with it. Uh, addictions. So people get into addictions. Addictions are a problem. But addictions are usually the reflect, the way of comforting and feeling better about the pain you've got inside your heart. How about that? Uh, it, the words people speak. If you listen to people, I'll give it away. 
They can't help but give it away if you listen carefully. If you're a listener and develop a listening heart, you'll hear people give stuff away. It just It's just like that. It's just in a moment, a word, a tone, and you can tell. That's what that's sitting in there. And that's how you look for it. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit reveals our brokenness. So what can we do? What can we do? If you know that there's something there, then you need to come before the Lord and ask him to bring healing. You need to ask him. It's your heart. Let him have your heart. Don't you try to control life. Bring him in because he loves you and knows what the issue is and where to find it. And you say, well, yeah, but, but I, it's like I want the appendix out, but I don't want the surgery. <laughs> that's, what, that's what people are like. You just cut it out, but I don't want to feel any pain. No, no, there's no way you can deal with it unless you go there. And, and that's where the, the issue is. The, the real issues are under the pain. And so, so ask the Holy Spirit. David prayed that way. He said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and try my heart. See if there be any wicked way or brokenness in me. And reveal it to me. You invite the Lord to come. So, if you, so the first, here's the steps. Number one, you need to recognize I've got something I've been sitting on for a long time. It's producing bad fruit. I recognize it. And even if someone else caused it, it's your heart. Be responsible for it. Blaming is a victim game. Blaming is a loser game. You, when you blame someone for why you are like you are, you've given up power to change what you are. You must actually take ownership of it. Thirdly, you just ask the Holy Spirit to uncover the root. So get in a time of worship, ask the Holy Spirit to uncover the root, and just ask simple questions. You know, what happened to me? When did this start? What happened to me? What is this problem I'm facing? What happened that caused this? How am I feeling about that? What is going on in my heart? And journaling is a great way to write it all out. And then how did I try to protect myself from being hurt again? Did I make judgments? Did I make vows? I'll never be like him. I'll never be like her. I'll, I'll, I'll never marry anyone like that. I'll, I'll never be poor. I'll never let my feelings. The, the, the vows we make reveal the pain and the judgments in our heart. That's the way you usually locate them. So, or sometimes we just believe wrong things. It's my fault. Every time an issue comes up, it's my fault. I grew up with that stronghold because of a religious environment. There's something wrong with you. There's always something wrong with you. You're a sinner. You know, when, when you take that on board and then something comes up, it must be my fault. So I had to deal with that. The Lord spoke to me and revealed it. And once I dealt with it, then that, that changed. So these are some of the things. We get attached to things. and, and We work harder. We try all kinds of stuff. But at the end, you just got to identify what the roots are and you bring the roots to the cross. You've got to bring it to the cross. The cross is the power of God for healing. Yet we want someone to fix us when God wants you to trust him and let him into your heart. It's like you've got rooms in your house and they're locked and you're not letting them in. And, and he's there and the, you've invited him into your life. And he's saying, but I want to go into that room. Oh, no, we don't go there. <laughs> well, I want to go there because I love you. I want to help you. I can bring healing if you'll acknowledge the pain and stop the control. <laughs> Get an idea. And then we need to actually come with repentance for our part in it, forgiveness for other people's part in it, and just grieving and letting go what has happened to us. The grieving part is important to letting go the, the issues of your heart. Most people try to forgive but never face the grief. You'd be better to stop and spend a bit of time, what happened and what am I feeling, and allow that to come up. And when you acknowledge your heart is in pain, See, it was trying to tell you when the tears came. But you pushed the tears down because you didn't want to hear your heart because you don't go there. Wow. You understand? You, but we must go there because that's where, we're, that's where our affections are formed. That's where we build our life with God. So it's not a complex process. I found just by simple journaling, recognizing, Father, there is an issue here. I remember the Lord just speaking to me recently about disappointments. I said, well, I'm going to write down what they all are. And I wrote, I said, Holy Spirit, help me. And I had about, oh, I had about eight or nine of them. Oh, I didn't realize. And then immediately the Lord said, do you know, let me tell you something about these things. They accumulate and they cause you to lose passion and love. They cause you to no longer look forward and hope. They cause you to draw back from trusting me. And he says, they will steal your future if you don't resolve them. 
So I said, I'll do it. So I took each one and wrote down what happened and how I felt, wept over it, gave it to the Lord, asked him to heal the pain, disappointment, and forgave the person and asked God to forgive me for covering it and not being honest with him. God desires truth in the inner parts. He doesn't want you running around doing everything. If you want to do that, that's great. But let that be the overflow, not the cover-up. Make sense? Why don't we close our eyes right now? Friends of God is here and you're watching online. God's wanting to help you where you are. And so what is it that the Holy Spirit is trying to show you right now? Some of you, it's with your father. And there's a huge blockage because of what happened, because of the way he was. Maybe he was very passive. Maybe he was very aggressive and your atmosphere of your home was filled with fear and anxiety and anger, maybe even with violence. Or maybe things happen that you're just so ashamed of it. Maybe it's with your mother and there was an issue with your mother and maybe she had trouble with alcohol or trouble with a mental breakdown or trouble with just couldn't handle life and and it's brought deep grief into your heart. Or maybe there's spoken words over you. Maybe you could never be good enough. Maybe there was poverty in the family and you've, you've struggled with the pain and the humiliation of that. Maybe it's things that happened at school. I can remember teachers standing over me, yelling, humiliating me in front of people. And I remember putting a wall in my heart to never listen to anyone who spoke to me like that again. I had to deal with all of that and forgive him. I remember weeping as I remembered what happened as a young child being ridiculed at school and having to actually face the pain and grieve over it and give it to the Lord and forgive the person. Understand it's, it's not rocket science. Maybe you've gone through a terrible trauma or betrayal, a breakdown in a relationship. Someone's used it for their own purposes. Or maybe you're just so disappointed because you've had so many setbacks. Whatever it is, why don't you say, Lord, tonight I recognize I am wounded and my heart is broken and I'm wanting you to come and heal me. I surrender control and I own the journey of facing the pain and the damage and working with you to repair it all. I choose tonight to open my heart and let you in to forgive those who've hurt me and to turn from walling my heart up like I have done. Just while our eyes are closed, how many people God spoke to you tonight? Just raise your hand right now. God bless hands everywhere. Amen. Let's just stand and worship Jesus. The presence of God is here to bring healing. And of course, with the healing, there's deliverance because spirits infest those places. Spirits infest them. Jesus said, if you won't forgive, there's like you're going to be delivered to tormentors. It's like they have a legal right. So we want to be free. Jesus is here to free us. I love him. I love him. I've spent so much time, <laughs> times in my life weeping. I thought it would never stop, but it stopped. But at times it was really intense. Intense. And I, but it, that's how you journey with God. You don't try to hide it. You're not better than, you know, you, you don't have to hide it. He just wants your heart. Give it to him. Let him in. Let him in. Why don't we come up? You know, as you want prayer tonight, just come up. We're going to lead you in a prayer. Just come up. Lift your hands to the Lord. Wherever you are, just come. If you can't get to the front, okay, wherever you are, God can touch you there. With whatever he does here, he can do for you. Just come. Let's come and let's just worship the Lord. And when you come, the first thing I want you to do is to just prepare your heart by talking to the Lord about the issue, admitting to the grief and pain, and releasing forgiveness to the person. Just do it right now. Come, come, come. Come on, let's worship him together. It's okay to feel the pain. It's okay to weep. The Holy Spirit is here. God loves you deeply. Your Father in heaven is the God who heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds. When there's nowhere to go, we turn to Him. When there's no comforters, we turn to Him. The Spirit of God is a comforter, searching our deeper most parts to bring healing and deliverance.
That's right. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him. He's a mighty God. He's holy without blemish. He loves you. to me now listen keep your eyes closed this is not about anyone else it's about your personal encounter with the Lord just listen now first prepare your heart talk to the Lord about what has happened to you no need to talk it out loud we're not going to be asking you all the questions about what's happened you tell him Jesus my heart is wounded I'm aware of it now this is what happened you know he knows it he wants you to to acknowledge it Lord, I just open the door. I surrender control. And Lord, I ask for you to come and heal my heart and set me free. I choose to forgive. Who do you need to forgive? Picture them and forgive them right now. Just release them. Have you made any vows, promises, judgments? What have you done to try and fix the pain? Lord, I repent of that right now. Maybe that addiction you've got has come right out of that place of pain. Renounce that you have attached yourself to something to fix you. In a moment, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. At the end of the prayer, we begin to worship the Lord. I will release the power of God to come on you. A team will come around and lay hands on you. God is going to touch you very powerfully. You'll feel the deliverance. Everyone's experience will be a bit different depending on how prepared you are and open you are. But God is here today because he wants to heal you. Some are weeping already because they're aware of that pain in their heart. That's right. Just come to him now. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. So I want you to follow. At the end of the prayer, worship. I'll pray over you, and then we'll come and lay hands on you. When we lay hands on you, stop praying. Just let God touch you. Just follow me in this prayer. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I've realized tonight that my heart has been broken. I've been holding grief and disappointment and trying to control and manage it. Lord, tonight I surrender control. I open my heart to you. Come into the places where I'm holding on to grief and shame and disappointment and bitterness. Lord, I choose tonight to forgive from my heart to release those who've hurt me. I forgive them now. I release them now. Now, Lord, I ask you to come and set me free. I claim freedom tonight. I claim freedom tonight. I claim freedom tonight in Jesus' name. I command every tormenting spirit, go from my life, go from my life now in Jesus' name. Come on, now let's worship the Lord together. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you handle if you're ready and, and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information, come upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.